what we're going to be talking about this day, as our last lecture, are diseases that are passed from water and food. And we call those two ways vehicles. We already have talked about a vector. A vector is when disease is passed by an animal to a person, for example. It could be a dog passing rabies to a person. It could be a mosquito passing malaria to a person. That is the uh, vector. But the vehicle is different. The vehicle is an inanimate, inanimate object. So we're going to be taking a look at the vehicle. So the vehicle in general, we can consider it to be water and food. Things that we are going to have what we call a common source. Now, we like to introduce to another piece of terminology, which is called the fomite. The fomite is also an inanimate, inanimate object, but it happens to be something other than food and water. So for example, HIV is transmitted by needles. That is the fomite that could be used to transmit. Uh, certain sexually transmitted diseases could be uh, spread by sharing sex toys. That is a fomite. Smallpox was passed by using blankets from people having smallpox to unsuspected native people. That was a fomite. So when we're thinking about uh, inanimate objects, we're going to have vehicles, food and water, and we're going to have fomites, which are objects. And when we think about food and water, the spread of disease with food and water has a different uh, dynamic than the person-to-person -person spread of disease. And we call this a common source epidemic. So for example, a well of water who got contaminated, and now the entire village goes and drinks from that water. So as you can see from this graph, if you're looking at the number of cases reported each day of a particular disease, and now you're looking at the days over here, zero being the onset of disease, if you have a common source of disease, like water or food, everybody gets sick together. So if we had a potluck and somebody brought potato salad that was contaminated, we all would get food poisoned together. So you have that really sharp number of uh, cases reported in time. That is different, as you can see, from the host-to-host -host epidemic, where one person has to come in contact with another person and pass the agent to that new person, and that person has to pass it to the next person. So the fact of contact-to-contact -contact, is going to affect the speed. And as you can see, the common source epidemic come up really quickly, and they can then resolve them once you identify the common source. Versus pinpointing the people infected in a host-to-host -host epidemic is a lot more difficult. And therefore, they have a much longer and slower um, dynamic to it. So when we think about food and water, we're going to be looking at a common source epidemic type of disease. Now, the food, excuse me, the water, I'm going to start talking about water first, and then we're going to go into food. Um, it could be either the water that we drink or the water that we play in. So the potable water that we are using for cooking as well as drinking, um, the recreational water that we're using like in the lake, if we go to the lake in Merced, or we, there's a pool that is not appropriately chlorinated. One thing that is not shown here are um, utility-style water systems. We're going to be talking about Legionella today. And Legionella is not ingested by water that you drink, but by water that you breathe as an aerosol. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So when we look at this, I got this little picture from uh, this website. And of course, here is the water that is coming to the house, which could be infected by chemicals, but we're going to be concerned more about microbes. So here you have your bacteria and your viruses that can infect the water. And that is coming from, for example, sewage and waste disposal areas, or it could be coming from animal waste and or animals that die. If a cow died and it landed in the lake, once the agent that killed the cow gets spread into the water, for example, now that is a common source. I remember watching a movie during the time of the plague in which this lord in the medieval time wanted to kill the neighbor lord and he threw dead rats into the well of his little hamlet. So, of course, everybody in that area started to get really sick in this movie because they were drinking the water, now with Yersinia pestis present uh, in it. All right, so we're thinking about water. 
water that we drink or cook with, water that we play on it, but also let's think about water that we are in, uh, that is surrounding us as vapor, like in an autoclave room, or more directly with legionnaires, like the water that we can have in an air conditioning cooling system in a hotel room or in a convention center. So now, when we look at the major water pathogens, we're going to have bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Of the ones we have talked a little bit about, we have Vibrio cholera, which causes uh, cholera, which is a diarrheal disease. We're going to be talking today about Legionella um, pseudophila, which causes Legionellosis. And that is the bacteria that actually gets, in, you get infected by it through the air. As the bacteria gets aerosolized through the air conditioned system in buildings. But you also have other things that you can get when you consume uh, water. So you can have E. coli, Pseudomonas, and other uh, bacteria like Salmonella. We're going to talk about Typhi for a little bit. There's, of course, viruses. Norovirus is a really important gastrointestinal illness virus. A lot of babies get norovirus um, from putting things in their mouth. And when we think about it also, we're going to talk about a couple of parasites. In particular, I like Giardia intestinalis because the little parasite looks like a spaceship from a, uh, a sci-fi movie. Yeah, they're really cool looking. Um, schistosoma is a nasty, it's a nasty disease that you can get from water, and it is in, it's a parasite that you get from water that has been uh, hanging stagnant, and there is a particular snail in the water that it's an intermediate vector to the parasite. And then Cristosporidium parvum, it is a, uh, another apicomplexan. We have talked about three apicomplexes in class. We have talked about uh, plasmodium for malaria. We have talked about toxoplasma gondii, when we're talking about movement and how that infects the brain. And we're going to touch a little bit in, in Cristosporidium parvum today. So now, let's think about water as the drinking water that we have. And the thing about water is that it's very impractical for us to be testing for every microbe that is possibly contaminating water. So what we have done instead of taking and looking at every potential pathogen is that, okay, there are certain bacteria that are present in the um, gut of animals, for example, that we can use as indicator organisms. Because if there is, for example, E. coli in water, E. coli come from feces, so it's easier to test for E. coli present in water than to test for a lot of a huge array of other microbes. So we call that indicator organisms, and they tend to be of the coliform family. So the coliforms are all gram-negative, non-spore-forming bacteria. You can find them, many of them in the gut of organisms, but not necessarily. They could be either in aquatic or soil environments and in vegetation. E. coli is one example of them. So, since a lot of them are in the fecal sample, we can say, okay, if there's fecal contamination in water, we should be able to test for a variety of coliforms. And most of them don't cause illness, even though we're going to be talking about an, an, uh, a disease causing E. coli. You all have heard about people getting E. coli from uncooked meat. Um, most E. coli are pretty harmless. We all have E. coli in our gut, and we don't get sick from it. So you just have to look for certain ones. And there's many tests that we can actually do in order to then get an SAD coliforms. One of the ones that I want to show you, I mean, are basically taking plates and streaking to see if they are bacteria present in the water. And other ones, like the one here in the middle, where you're looking at that blue colony, they use water, they filter it through a filter, and they cultivate now the filter in the area. So you're basically taking a much larger sample. But there's a little test over here, which is the EDEX Colilert test system. Like they put Colibacter and alert, and they made a word for it. And again, that is a proprietary substrate, so the company doesn't tell us what the heck it is in the tubes. And you have these three tubes that you can test. So if the sample is devoid, if the water sample is devoid of coliforms, it remains clear. If it has coliforms in it, it turns yellow. But if it has E. coli, it turns blue. So depending on the type of coliform that you're doing, you will have a different color. So it's just a way to check for a general number of organisms. Yes, Leah? How long does that test take? I believe that it takes 48 hours, but I'm not completely sure. 
It could be. I had to look that in the thing. That's some, that is an awesome question, Leah, and I didn't look at that more specific because I was more thinking about the test instead of the easiness of performing the test. But you have you bring a very good point. All right. So again, we're constantly testing water to see if it's present with potential coliform, and therefore we treat it. Now, we talked about already about vibrio cholera and the disease cholera, in particular when we're talking about the toxins and quorum sensing. So we discussed already that, uh, that vibrio cholera infects a person through tainted water, and that that tainted water eventually is going to have the bacteria, the bacteria gets to your intestine, and when the microorganisms form a biofilm and reach a particular cell number, they all turn the toxin gene simultaneously. And they're using that toxin to cause the imbalance in the um, electrolyte. Remember, the toxin is an AB toxin, and that A part is going to affect the adenocyclase, creating a lot of cyclic AMP that is going to now exchange the ionic content in the epithelial intestine, creating the diarrhea. And my hypothesis has always been that the bacteria is doing that to exit the host. Because once it exits, once it's infected, it needs to go into the next host. And the way to do it is to get rid of the, is to get out of the intestinal tract through diarrhea. So now, when we think about vibrio cholera, we do not have a lot of vibrio cholera in the US. Though people that go to different exotic places, Africa, Southeast Asia, the India, the Caribbean, and South America, Central America, they may get cholera and bring it home when they return. Um, and the best way to control it, because the organism, it is a gram-negative, motile organism. You can see it over there. It's gram-negative. You little flagellum right there. Um, it swims. So the best way to control it is to control the water. Usually, cholera comes into big problems when they have been water disasters, like hurricanes that now uh, cause floods that are going to go into the trains, that the trains now overflow, and they contaminate common source water reservoirs. That is when usually you have problems. So we have, we have disasters that are naturally, and cholera follows really close to it because of the way that contamination from sewer areas have now contaminated water sources. So as you know, when this goes, the vibrio cholera is going to have an attachment. You think about the diseases with those four steps, exposure, attachment, invasion, colonization. So it's going to attach to the epithelium. It's going to create a biofilm in there in small intestine. It's going to grow, and once they reach the right number, they're going to re release the toxin, the cholera toxin, as a colony. And that cholera toxin is the one that caused the diarrhea. <coughs> now, from here, I got some data from the World Health Organization that in 2011, there were 58 countries reporting cases of cholera. And of those, there were 589,000 cases of cholera of which only 7,800 were deadly. So that huge dehydration that can happen by diarrhea could be lethal, depending on where the place is. So it's actually a fatal rate of about 1.3, which is low compared to other diseases, because you can actually control cholera. So the disease um, is going to in give you this watery diarrhea. They call it rice water. I guess when you clean your, uh, your rice, you put the rice in water, you clean it, it becomes cloudy. That is the level of um, the, the consistency of the stool that you get. But it also has vomiting. It can uh, lower your blood pressure and give you other symptoms that you can see over here. Instead of listing everybody, I'm just going to jump on them. Uh, but people that get the acute level of cholera, they have renal failure because of the imbalance that they have. And those are the ones who usually die because the electrolyte imbalance will get them to a coma and get them into shock. So now, what do we do? Here is a picture of your rice water. It does look like horchata when you look at it, with a lot of cinnamon. So you basically, it does, come on. Very cinnamony horchata. Okay, so the patients go into this kind of cut, and the cut has a little reservoir hole. So they don't even move the patients where they're having, so they can uh, have their diarrhea and don't have to move. They collect the samples 
and they collect this here. So if you see the full figure in the book, you see, actually see the cut and the arrow. So I cut this out here. And then you test to make sure that you have bacteria, which you're going to have, but then you look for um, cholera there. And the whole thing is that we cannot really immunize very well. The bacteria is infecting the gut and gut immunization is a bit tricky. So you try to then tackle it from the perspective of the environment making sure that you have policies that are going to uh, prevent people from drinking contaminating water. Or if they have to drink water, then make sure they have to then decontaminate that water one way or another. So when somebody gets cholera, they have to be rehydrated because they're losing a lot of electrolytes to the diarrhea. And you also put them in antibiotic therapy. That's it for that. So here I put this little uh, hoop. Um, Slide. So you can see where the color is affecting, and you can see that it's actually in the large intestine. There are other bacteria that concentrate themselves into small intestine, but cholera is not one of them. So again, you treat it, you get the salt solutions and intravenous fluid and antibiotics. In communities that are unprepared because of those disasters that I've mentioned to you, um, you can have as really high death rates of cholera. Like 50% of the people infected with it could die if the community doesn't foresee it and take measures to it. And it's all because of the toxin. So the disease problem here is the toxin. And the toxin, um, you can create an antitoxin, but the antibodies against the toxin get washed out in the gut as the movement of food is passing through. So it's not an effective mechanism because the bacteria is not infecting inside the blood component. It is infecting the mucosa. And depending on the type of antibody, you need an IgA response. And the IgA response has to be boosted constantly to be able to keep it high. Anyway, so here you got cholera. As opposed to cholera, I want to introduce you to uh, Legionella pneumophila, which is the bacteria that cause legionellosis. And this is a combination of two diseases, one of them which is called the Pontiac fever, and the other one which is called Legionnaire's disease. And it's called Legionnaire's disease because in 1976, there was a convention of the American Legion in a convention center. And all these poor people became really sick with pneumonia and started to die. So how did all these people who were in this conference became sick and started to be affected by this pneumonia that killed them? They found that the source of it was the air conditioning system. And when they looked, they found this microorganism living in the vents of the air conditioning system, which was being made into an aerosol, kind of like we do with a humidifier. This cooling system uses water to cool the system on the vents. That makes water vapor, and there you go to happy bacteria flowing around in the water vapor droplets, like we do with a humidifier. And it goes into the system of the uh, cooling system and air conditioning system of the convention center, and everybody breathed, uh, breathed the, same, uh, the water droplets and got infected with this microorganism. So it is a gram-negative. It is a facultative intracellular. The bacteria living in the water, it's living free. But in the infection, it's living in macrophages. Sort of like oh, which other bacteria lives in macrophages when it infects? Huh? Tuberculosis. Thank you. Tuberculosis. So... This is, and it's called a facultative intracellular parasite because it does it when it needs to. It's not, um, it actually lives in water in an amoeba. So the amoeba is relatively similar, and I forgot the species of the amoeba, but the anima, amoeba, excuse me. So I forgot the name of the species of the amoeba, but it's, the, the amoeba is sufficiently close in, in shape and type to the macrophage, so the bacteria infects the amoeba, uh, the macrophages. So, um, it lives in the cooling towers and evaporate condenser systems in large air condition systems. So, big convention centers, big hotels. There was a recent exposure in a New York hotel. And the people in the hotel in New York were not affected, but the people around the Bronx, New York, that little vapor that comes out of the hotel, was infecting everybody around it. So, I, I, I know an article about that. Hot tubs. Not protected hot tubs will get it. But water tanks, plumbing systems, and decorative fountains. So again, when the fountain is heating and the little bottle, uh, water droplets come out, they may contain Legionella bacteria. So it, is, um, it likes the warm water, 
That's why the cooling system works, because the water is helping to cool the system and it's a little bit hot. And it is uh, spread not person to person, but it's spread to the air through that aerosolized water. So people who got Legionella are not infectious to other people directly. Yes? Um, you mentioned the hot tubs. Is that like... Uh, is it affected by the chlorine of the hot tubs like, at all? Or is it... it should be. But the thing is that if it goes inside the amoeba, it's protected by the chlorination. So it can have protection, and, and actually Giardia does the same thing. We're going to talk about Giardia later. So the problem goes is that you have to be very diligent by maintaining the appropriate chlorination levels in pools and hot tubs to maintain it into a bacteriocidal state. And, not, and most of us sometimes forget to take care of our hot tubs. We put the tarp on it, we leave it there for six months, oh, it's nice and, warm, it's nice and cold tonight, let's go to the hot tub, we just turn it on, and think that everything is going to be okay. So we don't, know, we don't do a lot of maintenance to a lot of those things, especially if you're not thinking about using it. Oh, we just take the tart, jump in the water. Yes, Vanita? It should be affected by it, but oftentimes it's not. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't control the chlorination in water, the amoeba will then survive. So... Yeah. Mm -hmm. If the chlorination has, if you have been doing the, the cleaning and maintenance on it, it should be fine. Yeah. So don't be afraid to go into your hot tubs the next time that you go somewhere. <laughs> Just keep in mind where you're going to. So now, this, really, this bacteria is well responsive to the antibiotics that we use, especially for, Le for Legionella, excuse me, for Legionnaire's disease. Pontiac fever burns out of itself, so we don't recommend, doctors don't recommend using antibiotics for Pontiac fever. Pontiac fever was discovered in Pontiac, Michigan. That's where the name comes from. And they couldn't know what the bacteria was until they identified Legionella by the Legionnaire's disease, and then they found out that it was the same microorganism. So if there is, as it says here, proper maintenance and design of water-dependent cooling and heating systems, that could prevent... Um, Legionella spread. And that was the gripe of the hotel in New York. They said, we just got this new system. Why are we worried about this when we have a brand new state-of-the-art cooling system in this hotel? It didn't work for them. So when you're thinking about this, make sure um, to remember that water-based diseases doesn't have to be simply the water that we drink or cook with or swim in. It could be also the aerosols that we are breathing. Okay? And that's why I decided to chose Legion RTD because it's, I mean, it's water-based. It's a water-based disease, but it's not the water that we drink nor the water that we eat. Now, I found this uh, table in the Center of Disease Control website that talks about the difference between the Pontiac fever and the Legion RTD disease, and I thought that it was going to be interesting for you guys. So, the Pontiac fever has flu-like illnesses with the chills, the, the chills, the chills, fever and malaise, but it doesn't give you pneumonia. Legionnaire's disease give you full-blown pneumonia type disease. And if you take the x-ray out of the patient, you will see the, the pneumonia-like conditions and lesions in the chest of the patient with Legionnaire's disease, but not with Pontiac fever. Now, there's also a difference in the incubation period. Pontiac fever has a one day to three day uh, um, exposure disease, Whereas Legionella is between 2 to 10 days, and could be longer depending on the person. Now, 90% of the people exposed to Legionella can get um, Pontiac fever, but only about 5% of the people get Legionnaire's disease. So you have a very different etiology of the disease. And whereas you can get organisms in patients from the sputum of patients we have Legionnaire's disease, you cannot get it with the Pontiac disease. Very interesting. So now, this one, Pontiac fever, is not lethal. Legionella can kill you. So Legionnaire's disease can kill you, and it requires hospitalization. We consider it a very life threatening illness. Pontiac fever burns off on itself. Yeah. Exactly why? I don't know. Let's start with Reed first. Legionella is a combination of both or 
Legionellosis is the umbrella that under that have under one Legionnaire's disease as well as Pontiac fever. Yeah. Because it's caused by the same microorganism infection. So, if I understand your question, you're talking about the capacity of isolating bacteria from a patient with Legionnaire's disease versus Pontiac fever? Yeah, because it seems to me that like, what the chart is saying is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you get Pontiac fever, it's almost as though it's like because you can't isolate it, it's connected to the fact that if you get high um, pneumonia as well. So, I'm trying to see if there's causation there. I see what you mean. So my hypothesis of this is the issue that I think that Pontiac fever, the organisms are rapidly cleared and they do not get to the state because you're not getting them in the lungs. It may be an upper respiratory infection as, co as opposed to a deep lung respiratory infection because that's the definition of pneumonia. So I think that is part of that issue, but I am not completely sure. So, yeah. Anyway, any questions about these two illnesses? No? All right. Let's look about food, the last part of the lecture. So now, there's a, a distinction that I want to make for you, the difference between food poisoning and food infection. Because we tend to think about them as one issue. I got food poison because I got food poison because I got bacteria. Well, not quite. So, Food poisoning, it's the disease that you get when you ingest the toxins made by bacteria, like botulism. Okay? And usually, you do not get the bacteria itself. You get the toxins. So remember that we talked about botulism and canning? The fact that, as you can see here, the can, here's your normal can. Here's the can that now has become engorged by air. These microorganisms tend to be gram-negative fermentative microorganisms, so they produce gas when they ferment, and the gas is what's going to make the can burst. So if you ever see a can that is slightly increased like that, don't eat it. Don't eat the food in it, because most likely it got contaminated by a clostridium. And during the canning process where you heat the food, you activate the spores which are present in the contaminating food. The spores mature, they become bacteria. Now you have an environment where the bacteria has plenty of food and no oxygen, which they love because they're anaerobic microorganisms. So they ferment the food, they release the toxin to the environment, they die off eventually because they run out. So the environment becomes toxic to them, so they die, but the toxin stays. And that is what is the issue about food poisoning. On the other hand, you have the food infection, where you actually now have microbes that you are injecting because the food has contamination with this. They may involve toxins as well in the etiology of the disease, but it's a different that you're getting live organisms that are going to infect you, so we're going to talk about the exposure, adhesion, uh, colonization, and invasion. Invasion and colonization, excuse me. That will be part of the food infection versus when you're thinking about food poisoning, we're going to be concentrating more in the toxins per se. Okay? And here, in this table from um, table 31.5, I just chose the piece of it that shows bacteria. There's, three there's two other pieces, one for viruses and one for um, parasites. For um, Okay, there you go. My, my Alzheimer's is hitting in. Huh? Plasmodiums is a... Proton, thank you. This is the second time that I cannot think of the word protozoan to save my life. I tell you, Alzheimer's is coming for me. So here, um, we have a list of the bacteria. Take a look at that. And now you can see the disease either as food poison or food infection. So you can see the difference between the two. And some microorganisms, like Bacillus cereus, can cause food poisoning because of the toxin, but can also cause food infection. So take a look about that, and here are the foods which are usually uh, the culprits carrying these microorganisms or the infection. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about staph infection, so Staphylococcus aureus. It's also a really 
important food poisoning bacteria. We talked about it causing impedigo, methicillin-resistant uh, flesh-eating disease. Here we're going to be looking at E. coli O157H7, which is the bacteria E. coli that causes the food infection from meat. And I don't know if you have been following the news with Chipotle. <laughs> yeah, so Chipotle has been having some issues. They think that it's norovirus, but it could be E. coli. So there's, they're trying to figure out, and that's causing a lot of the stores to close. But I mean, Jack in the Box went through it. McDonald's went through it. Um, a lot of different restaurants have gone through it. Carl's Jr. went through it for a while. So there is a big issue when you have massive production of food and many people getting their dirty hands in that food preparation. So we're going to be talking about some of these microorganisms. So let's start with staph food poisoning. And I found this little cartoon with George Staphylococcus where he is running, grubbing himself in his stomach because he's going to have the runs. That's basically what the poor guy is having. And here we go back to that gram-positive Staph aureus bacteria. And it produces a heat-stable enterotoxin. As of one of the many different kinds of virulence factors that it has, it makes a toxin that is heat-stable. And you will know that you have the infection within 30 minutes of getting the food. The toxin is that active. So now, it causes a gastroenteritis. Within a few hours of eating, you get nausea, you get retching, vomiting, stomach cramps, and diarrhea. And that's when little George Staphylococcus is running, because he needs to make it to the toilet really quickly. Now, because it is a toxin-based disease, that food poisoning, I cannot pass it to another person. Because you're getting the toxin doing the damage to it, and toxins don't reproduce. You cannot pass it. So if I were to get this kind of food poisoning, and let's say that Anne is taking care of me, the chances of her getting it from me are very little because I don't have the bacteria. So it's estimated that we have now um, between 185,000 cases of staph food poisoning each year in the U.S. So it's just a lot of people getting staph infections. That is one kind of food poisoning. Now we have the other one that we have talked a little bit about, and that is Clostridium food poisoning. Let's think about botulism in this case. But you can now be, we talk about botulism a lot, so I'm not going to talk about it as much, but we're going to be looking at Clostridium perfringens, and that is the, one of the main um, bacteria that causes uh, Clostridium food poisoning. And again, they're Clostridia, they're gram positive microorganisms, and they make spores. All the Clostridium bacteria are spore forming. So you have here Clostridium um, botulism and the other one um, perfringens next to it. So about 250,000 annual cases of Clostridium perfringens food poisoning in the U.S. alone. The thing about it is that we have Clostridium perfringens in our gut. So in order for you to get a severe infection, you need to you need to get a really large number of bacteria. So oftentimes when there is an imbalance in the populations of our gut, it's when this comes up to play because now they have grown, so antibiotic treatment. So in order for you to get the disease, you have to get a lot of microorganisms because we have a lot of them have, and we do not get the poisoning from it. Now, you will get symptoms between 6 to 24 hours after consuming either the bacteria in the case of the food infection or the toxin in the case of food poisoning. And you have what? Abdominal pains, which are really, really wretched, stomach cramps and diarrhea. It could give you nausea, but you do not vomit. So you could be feeling really nauseous without vomiting. That is one of the key cases that makes it different from the staph infection, which you will vomit. And um, it all, it's the one day food poisoning that we call it. You get it in 24 hours, you're fine. So you have to treat the symptoms. The potential diarrhea, the, the uh, loss of hydrolytes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay? That is the opposite of the really life-threatening disease, which is botulism. And botulism, as we talk, is caused by the Clostridium botulinum, and it's because of the botulinum toxin. And the botulinum toxin, as we talked about, what is it doing? It's the flaccid paralysis. 
remember the passive phalaris, what is it doing? It is preventing acetylcholine receptor, uh, acetylcholine release, excuse me, from the motor neurons. So therefore, instead of the, the muscle receiving a signal to contract, it is constantly in the relaxed state. So this young guy, a 14-year-old boy, has been infected with botulism, notice that he cannot really open his eyes very well. His eye muscles are not responding, the eyelid muscles are not responding to, to have them open. So when you open his eyes, the pupils themselves don't even contract. They, I mean, they're not responding to the amount of light for his irises to become small, as you normally will do when you shine a light to your eye. So oftentimes you look at a patient and that droopy eye is, will be a dead giveaway of botulism. Fiction. Now botulism can be caused and passed by three different mechanisms. One of them is infant. So a lot of little children get botulism because they actually get spores from the bacteria and they ingest those spores and they grow in their intestines. Now they grow in the intestines, they're really toxic. So that will be a food infection mechanism. Now, yeah. Or dirt. Yeah. So you get in the, the spores, the spores germinate in the gut of the infant and therefore they start to produce toxin at the gut level. And that's like the most cases of... Yeah. The majority of the cases are infants. Now, you can get botulism through a wound. Now you get the wound that has the infection of the bacteria. The bacteria will release toxin. Now you get the botulism as well. So that is about 15% of the cases. And the last level of cases, again, another 15%, is because of food. So now consuming the food canning food especially, that we have canned ourselves, um, that now has the toxin, and the toxin causes the symptoms. So all of them can be fatal and are considered med medical emergencies. So if you are taking care of a little baby and you can pick it up and the baby is droopy, you know how little babies, when you pick them up, the little head goes up, they can hold themselves nicely, by you. if you get them by the little hands, you can pick them up, and they have the reflex to be picked up, the droopy baby, which is completely droopy, you pick them up and they are feeling like a rag doll, most likely botulism. So run to the hospital with that little kid. Yes, Benita. Yes, all the clostridia are spore forming. So clostridium difficile, uh, perfringens, botulinum, tetani. All of them produce spores. Yeah. The bacteria gets destroyed by heat. The um, excuse me. The toxin is destroyed by heat, not the spore. So remember that what you have. Let's go back to the example that we used with the green beans in class. You got the green beans. The green beans had the spore because the bacteria is present on the soil. You now do the heating for the canning of those green beans, that, that activates the spore. The spore germinates, the bacteria grow, release toxin. You usually don't heat that food anymore when you're using it. If you heat the food, the, the toxin can be destroyed. So the toxin is heat labile. The, the spore is not, all right? So the, the, don't confuse the two, all right? Okay, so those are the two food poisoning uh, examples that I want to give you. So make sure, and again, this comes to the idea of the common source illness. So somebody make the food nicely, bring it to a party, there goes the potluck, and a lot of people get sick immediately. That's the common source. It was the potato salad or the chicken salad that was not properly made. Whatever it is, it's a common source. And that had that rapid onset of cases in a very short amount of time because a lot of potential hosts tab in the same source, right? Now, let's look at food infection, and here we're gonna have a bird's eye view into salmonellosis, E. coli, which are pathogenics, and listeria. And I'm going to show you at least one slide of protozoa, which is the Giardia, one that I want to show you. So now, salmonella, we have, is a bacteria that we fear a lot when we're dealing with eggs and chickens because they're present in the intestine of poultry. But they're also be uh, present in people that have reptiles as pets. So turtles, snakes, geckos, um, 
um, what is a little uh, spiny dragons? Huh? Yeah. All kinds of little reptiles have salmonella. So now, you can get salmonella because the food has not been properly cleaned. So eggs that are grown in really crowded environments, the hens are going to defecate on the eggs or defecate outside and walk all over the eggs with their feces contaminated on their legs, which contaminate the surface of the egg. So range or free range where the chickens can do, take their walk, do their business outside, come back to lay on their eggs, lowers the amount of this. We have had a lot of salmonella antibiotic resistance because we started giving salmonella, excuse me, giving antibiotics to the chickens to prevent them. And that, it's counterproductive. Changing the, uh, the environment where the chickens are growing is a lot easier. So you can let the chicken be a free range chicken. So you can have clean chicken meat and clean eggs. So now, the disease gets onset pretty quickly, about eight hours post exposure. And it can be resolved within five days. Now, um, salmonella poses a big problem because there are 2,500 different serotypes of the bacteria. That's a lot of different serotypes. And all of them, of those, less than 100 are thought to cause disease. So you still have 100 different serotypes of bacteria of salmonella that can cause disease. So you have issues about which one to be medically used to treat. Now, um, in the US, you have about a million illnesses due to salmonella infection with 19,000 hospitalizations and 380 deaths. Not that it's very similar, but I remember being a grad student at Stanford and going to a very high-end uh, supermarket right before a movie, and I ate a mushroom sandwich, or a bella mushroom sandwich. That night, I was freezing. I was having chills, and when I woke up, I basically had a fever of 42, even though I was freezing. And I started to throw up. And basically, I couldn't hold any food. Got sent to the hospital where I went into shock <laughs> from the contaminated sandwich. So it's very serious. Thank God for Stanford Medical uh, Student Health Centers. They put me there for an entire day with IVs. I got three IVs to recover all the fluids I was losing and a huge amount of antibiotics. And it was one of these bugs. So you have to be very careful. And trust me, when you are in shock and are hallucinating, it's not a good thing. Because you have absolutely no way without immediate treatment, I would have not been here. So it's really, really bad. From a contaminated sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. Which one is what? Oh well, no. It's just showing. It's just showing you chicken breast and eggs as a potential source of salmonella. No, no, one, no. Both of them could be potential source. Okay. No, it's not showing that one is based on another. Now E. coli. Again, one single slide. E. coli to be pathogenic, it has to have a plasmid that has the toxin, and the toxin is called the Shiga toxin. Now that is the O one fifty seven H seven that produces that toxin, and I went online and I started to search this up. There is the Shiga toxin E. coli, that is the STEC. There have the enterotoxigenic E. coli, which is the ETEC. There is the enteroinvasive E. coli, which is the IEEC. And then they have the enteropathogenic E. coli, that is the EPEEC. The CDC has all those listed, and they are way too many pathogenic reasons why they're all different. I'm just bringing it here to you from the issue that all of them are intestinal parasites that produce toxins, and you get that from to uh, contaminated food, meat in particular. Now, the last two that I'm going to go really quickly over are the Campylobacters, and Campylo means squiggle, so you can see that the bacteria are squiggly rods. You can see that they're gram-negative as well. Now, this is very serious. We have about a four, 2 million cases of diarrhea caused by Campylobacter, um, Campylobacter, excuse me, every year. And here you have 
the raw food, the raw poultry, the pork, the shellfish, and anything that has been in contact with the water that is contaminated by this bacteria. It's an intestine, it's a bacteria that replicates in the small intestine, as opposed to cholera that is a large intestine bacteria. And what you get, high fever, headache, the crappy feeling of feeling ill, that's malaise, the nausea, really nasty abdominal glands, and in certain cases you get blood in your stools. So the destruction, all right? Last but not least, let's go with Listeria. Listeria monocytogenes, it is a m massively mortal disease. About 20% of the people infected with Listeria die. It is an intracellular parasite, and we, just, we talked a little bit about it in Bio-110 because it uses the actin filaments to propel itself in the cell. Remember the actin comets? flying around inside the cell, that is Listeria. So it can cause bacteremia, which as you know is the amount of bacteria in your blood, but it can also get to your brain and cause meningitis, or to the spinal fluid. And it is found in all kinds of food, so there, it is everywhere that you can look for. Now it is psychotolerant. It's not that it's tolerant to psychopaths, it's tolerant to cold. So cooling food is not a really good way to try to prevent contamination of listeria. So it goes inside phagosomes and that's where it resides. So therefore it has a mechanism of evading the immune system as it is inside now the phagosomes. All right? So not a lot to, for me to talk to, about this guy. But the last one that I want to bring out to you is the Giardia. And Giardia is now a eukaryote. As you can see, they are, this is the epithelium. The parasite is attached analogously with a soccer cup to the wall of the intestine. And as you can see, it's just not one. There's hundreds of them in the intestine. So it is part of the protists that are able to infect. So we talk about Giardia, uh, Toxoplasma gondii, with food that has been contaminated, uh, particularly pork. So you will find it in your food that has been contaminated with fecal matter. And as you can see, if you were to Google this parasite, I mean, for a parasite, it's gorgeous. It really looks like a little spaceship when it's swimming around. It's actually very cool. So when you have Giardia intestinalis, you have to think about different ways to attack it because now you're talking about a protozoan, which is an eukaryote just like us. So antibiotic treatments are not useful to treat it. You have to go with different treatments. And you have to make sure that to prevent, because this, as they're being shed from the intestine, you, anything that is being in contact, feces and other uh, diarrhea that is in contact in the water, that is used to uh, spray on crops, or the food that is prepared will be contaminated with the organism. It's resistant to acid because you injected it back and it can pass the stomach. So it has mechanisms to avoid a lot of the issues that our barriers are protecting us so Giardia can prevent it. Anyway guys, I'll stop there. Um, this is the last lecture, I just wanted to include the picture of Giardia intestinal because I think it's very cute. And um, I want to thank you again for an awesome semester. Um, I'm going to post this lecture for you.